Are you always coming up with ideas? Do you marvel at successful business owners? Do you hate being told what to do? Ever take things apart just to see how they work? Are you a dreamer? If you've answered yes to any of these questions, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Entrepreneurial Enclave with Kevin Wortham. The podcast that focuses on building, maintaining, pivoting, planning, and investing in you, the entrepreneur. But first, a word from our sponsor. Tapes' Specialties is the world leader in tape manufacturing and specialty conversion with over 40 years of experience. In addition to our pro brand of high-quality specialty adhesive tapes, we provide contract converting services that help improve your profitability, streamline your supply chain, and reduce inventory cost. We offer the most complete range of converting capabilities in the industry, such as... Cloth tape, double coated tape, specialty tape, paper tape, masking tape, vinyl tape, carton sealing tape, adhesive transfer tape, duct tape, phone tape, electrical tape, filament tape, foil tape, reflective tape. And the tape just keeps on rolling. Visit us online today at www.protapes.com or call us at 800 345 Pro Tapes, it's just how we roll. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another fantastic episode of the Entrepreneurial Enclave, Life's Coming Attraction. Today, man, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to hit you with the double, with the double, with the double. Dr. T and your daughter, Laura, is on the line. Laura, talk to me. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you. How are you? Fantastic. Man, this is going to be a great interview. There's so much excitement, so much enthusiasm in your voice. So let's, let's do this. Let's start off from the beginning. How did I meet you? I mean, besides meeting your mother and father, how did I meet you? <laughs> well, first off, we go to the same church, so. Oh, I didn't know I that. No, okay. Yeah, of course we go to the same <laughs> church. <laughs> hey, Dr. But, T, uh, she wants to be a comedian too now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, I did uh, your mining our business program, which was super a great experience. Yes. I had my first experience of making my own business yes. and I did a hair care business which is embraced by Laura Simone okay and that was a really great learning experience of starting taking initiatives and which led me to take initiatives to other things like now I made my school's first black student union and I used some of the same business plan models to make that happen Awesome. I am so proud of you. And again, in full disclosure, yes, we all go to the same church. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so now let's, 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 let's talk about your musical career. What drew you to the instrument and which instrument do you play? Yeah. So I play the bass. Yes. And I started in fifth grade. At the, I actually was about to play cello, but then my mom showed me a video of S. Brown's spotting playing at the White House. Yes. Uh, it was in front of Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. He was singing on the sunny side of the street. Yes. And after seeing that video, I felt really inspired, and I saw myself in her. And I was like, all right, yeah, I can do that too. Wow. <laughs> wow. So you are a junior or a senior in high school now? I'm a junior now, 15 excellent. years old. Excellent, excellent. And so musically, what would you like to do with your career? Musically, Musically yes. I'm still sort of trying to navigate and figure out exactly what I want to do. Okay. But I'm thinking because of all of my activist side and me being president and founder of Black Student Union and uh, vice president of Students for Social Activism and, and all of these different activism clubs, Yes. I'm hoping that I can learn to combine music with uh, activism more and social justice and promoting social justice. Wait, wait, time out, time out, time out. You said you are the president of the student union? I'm the founder and president of the Black Student Union. The Black Student Union at your high school? Yes. So, so, how, do you become, so how do you become the founder? Wasn't there always one or such a club or such an organization? 
No, unfortunately, there what? the last time there was a Black Student Union was 1970. Wow. So, so wow. So, so yeah. also congratulations on that. You are a mover and a shaker. So, what are some of the issues that you are tackling within your school now? Yeah. Well, actually, we just there was a racial incident that happened at our homecoming football game. Yes. Uh, and that was a big shock. Okay. If you would say. Yes. And after that, in com- in combination with the George Floyd incident and Breonna Taylor, all of that, all of those movements being pushed yes. during the summer, I felt inspired. And actually, I was just upset that we didn't have one in the first place because almost every school that I know, or at least all my friends, have a Black Student Union at their yes. school or something like that. So I definitely thought that my school needed that to just educate ourselves so that we can educate our peers. I love it. Man, so, so much wisdom, so much insight. So, so listen, so what is the vision for you being the founder for your organization for next year, your senior year? What are some of the things that you're looking to accomplish? I'm hoping to put in further collaborations with my other clubs that are actually still there. So like, for example, I'm vice president of student social activism, which is a relatively new club, but that's more focused on not just black history and black culture, but it's focused on more of like LGBTQ, IA plus rights and um, Pakistani, et cetera. Uh, So I'm really hoping that we can further do more collaborative events together. Yes. And I can try and reach out to different groups. Like, for example, we've had uh, during Black History Month, we, we as in Black Student Union, collaborated with STEM Academy. Yes. Uh, which was Science Academy, basically. And we had a big science event of saying all of the Black inventors, uh, Black uh, astronauts, Black people in STEM. Awesome. Oh, I'm awesome. hoping to have a lot more of that. Now, let's let's go a little further. Collegiately, where would you like to go to school? What would you like to major in? And does music still uh, hold, um, I guess, does, yeah. does music still hold uh, a future for you? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm looking. I'm Okay. So I'm not exactly sure yet. Okay. But I do definitely want to continue with music. Yes. Um, I'm still sort of trying to figure out how I can combine my different likes. Because I think the problem with me is that I have so many different passions that it's hard to choose exactly just one to try and focus on. Yes. Um, so I think the easiest thing for me right now to think about doing is trying to major in music and then after I get uh, my music career started or further developed, I can then bring in different um, different thoughts of what I want to do, like bringing in activism and music, bringing in all of the different social justice things that I want to accomplish. I've got one for you. Ready for this one? They say mm-hmm. music soothes the savage beast, right? You've heard that saying before? Yes, of course. Okay. So while you're playing your music at a concert, you can invite the various groups and in between each song that you're playing, you can have a Q and A. Right? Mm. Just a just a thought. Just a thought. Just a thought. All right. Now Yeah, I definitely love that. See, see, right? All right, here we go. So now with your musical career, were you influenced by any way by your mother's, um, I guess, your mother's rise to success? I mean, your mother, your mother's internationally known now. She's a superstar. Oh, yeah. Did, did that have any, any in, <laughs> did that have any influence on you choosing music? Yes, of course. Okay. As I said before, she was the reason why I chose bass, but yes. always with her, I've been learning how to harmonize, like, out, straight out from birth. I've been learning how to harmonize on the spot with her, singing with her, singing with her in church. Yes. Uh, she's also an educator, of course. 
Yes. So that has really inspired me to do teacher education, whether it be in Black Student Union or I started a new program actually this year uh, teaching fourth to sixth grade girls. It's called a Queen Amina, Queen Amina Music Pro- Program. Yes. And each week I've been teaching these girls more specifically jazz, but just women composers and women musicians that are sort of left out of the main topic. What? Unfortunately. Wait, wait, let's, let's slow down. I wait. <laughs> when do you sleep? Well, wow, this is fantastic. <laughs> wow. Say that, say that again. I, I want, I want the listening audience to hear that one more time. Say that again. Okay. Um, well, basically I started a fourth through sixth grade program for yes. girls who are instrumentalists. Yes. Uh, it's at my local, actually my little brother goes to that school. Okay. Um, he can't be in the program though because he's a boy, but Understood. hopefully next time, hopefully later I will be more inclusive to boys also. But right now, since girls, there are not many women in jazz, yes. the representation isn't there and it's mainly already boys. Yes. I really wanted to try and focus on bringing in more diverse groups. Yes. Uh, to try and focus on um, contributing to the bigger representation that is needed in jazz and just music in general. I love it. So much wisdom, so much maturity. I can retire tomorrow because I, I know that with you, <laughs> the world is going to be better off. No, this is fantastic. This is fantastic. So now, where would you like to go to college? Um, I've been thinking of a lot of different places. Of course, Princeton University, as that's where my mom uh, works. Yes. As that where my mom works now. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I said work. Um, and actually, I'm really close to the jazz program. Uh, this year, I've been invited to be a part of the Princeton University Creative Large Ensemble under Darcy James Argue. So working with the college students, seeing all of their experiences as they get to share and then just performing with them at each concert, of course, has been a wonderful experience. And that has made me really see myself want to take Princeton as an option. Yes. Uh, Another option that I've been looking at has been Michigan State University recently. Yes. Um, And this is mainly because um, Roddy Whitaker, who is a legendary bass bass player, um, he runs the jazz program there. So that has been a big pool of me wanting to potentially go there. Um, another is, of course, Juilliard and yes. Manhattan School of Music as conservatories. And um, the last one, I think, is Peabody, John Hopkins Peabody. Yes. Uh, because Sean Jones, a wonderful, fantastic trumpet player, who I'm actually going to see later in the summer, uh, for another program, but I can talk about that later. Um, he runs the jazz program there. So just these different pools. I'm definitely keeping my options open, and I'm definitely open to seeing other colleges like Spelman, I know, has a great music program. So yes. I've been looking at HBCUs and everything. Just- wow. I, man. What? So, so, hey, Dr. T, listen. I'm going to have to call you back. We're going to do our own interview. Your daughter is wonderful, man. <laughs> <laughs> and she hasn't even talked about Carnegie Hall yet. I, I mean, know. come I, on. Wow. We. <laughs> and jazz at Lincoln Center. I'm yes. saying this girl's a star. All right. So <laughs> now your mother, just she just dropped the bag on that. So now you've got to tell me about jazz at Lincoln Center. Tell me about that. What's going on there? Oh, yeah. So. Originally, um, nonchalantly. Oh yeah. Ninth, <laughs> in ninth grade, uh, when I sort of seriously started started jazz, yes. I went to the New Jersey Youth Symphony Jazz Orchestra under Julius Tolentino. Yes. And that experience of seeing different competitions and just performing has really, I think, shaped my wanting to do jazz. Okay. And in 10th grade, I ended up joining um, Jazz at Lincoln, uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center Youth Orchestra. Yes. And this was only possible because of Corona, actually, um, because of COVID-19. Yes. Since all of the bands were online anyway. Got you. 
And I was introduced to Jazz at Lincoln from Todd Stoll, who I met through NASME, or the National Honors Ensemble, Jazz Ensemble. So, and he is actually the president or executive president of, sorry, executive director of Jazz at Lincoln Youth. He's the uh, vice president of education for the Jazz and Lincoln Center. Yeah. Okay. Thank so. you. Yeah. No, it's, it's okay. It's so, yeah. okay. Tag team. It's okay. He was, uh, he is the Nationals director. Yes. And through him, I got connected to Jazz at Lincoln and auditioned for that. And ever since I've been staying with them, and it's been really great traveling to New York every Sunday, which thank you, Mom, for doing. I know it's a lot, two hours each Sunday. But well, it's been I, I, amazing. So experience. let me let me tell you what's what's going on. So your mother does this for two reasons: one, because she loves you; but two, she knows that when you make it big, she's going to give you a bill for how much you owe. Her. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't 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 thank her now. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Man, that's, that, listen, that is fantastic. That's nothing but dedication. Now, I want to ask this question, and I want to see if this is possible. Within your short-lived jazz career, do you see how music can kind of solve some of the social injustices that we face? Oh, yeah, for sure. And uh, just acknowledging the past, yes. how much uh, music, had to do with the civil rights movement, yes. whether it be um, Max Roach's work or with Abby Lincoln, their album, The Freedom Suite, or just Mahalia Jackson and Duke Ellington, who worked very closely with Martin Luther King and um, Louis, Louis Armstrong, who broke barriers for Black people, um, integrating audiences, just et cetera like that. Yes. I definitely see the um, correlation there. Now, now you also said that you sing, right? What is your particular <laughs> genre of singing? It's it, is it more gospel, uh, or is it or is it just Negro spiritual? What what was that? How would you classify that? So publicly, I guess you can say gospel and jazz mainly. Yes. Gospel, okay. of course, because uh, in church almost every Sunday I sing there. Yes. Um, and but if you look on my Instagram, you will see more jazz vocals but i'm not really someone who puts like limitations on myself of what i can sing you know got you got you fantastic listen it's, so is there i mean before i i switch over, i still want you to hang out but before i switch over to your mother any shout outs you want to give to any anybody that uh, may perhaps listen to this oh yeah um well i forgot to mention the Jazz at Lincoln yes. Center Youth Orchestra is directed under Tadam Greenblatt, who I love dearly. He's amazing. Um, Sean Jones, who I mentioned before, yes. he's definitely a big inspiration. Um, that was actually what I was talking about. Uh, the summer program yes. that I recently found out I got into, um, it's called NYO Jazz or the National Youth Orchestra Jazz Ensemble. Yes. And under that, I will be performing at Carnegie Hall July 28th, which I'm super excited about because I have never been to Carnegie Hall before. So the fact that playing is my first time that will, that will be me being there is just absolutely insane to me. And that will be with Jasmine Horn, who is the guest artist. Yes. And after that, we will do a tour of the U.S. So I'm really looking forward to that. What do you mean tour? Like, like, Go to different cities, different concert venues. Yep, all over, during all the, over. Uh, during the summer or during the school year? During the summer. What? Oh my God! I am so happy. I'm so proud of you. Wow, wow, that is all Thank right. Thank you. I'm really excited for it. I already checked out all of the other people in the band, and they are super talented. So yes. I'm just really excited for this opportunity but but not that you're not okay so let's let's talk about talent how often do you practice how often do i practice yes um well actually that is something that sort of changes each week yes um i try to practice an hour but usually 
that does not happen all of, all of the time. Okay. But I've been really trying to focus uh, recently on making a schedule so I'm consistent yes. rather than just having splurges of long practices. And I think that's one of the problems that comes with being in so many ensembles. Yes. That sometimes your rehearsal, because uh, I rehearse like multiple times a day, of course, in all these ensembles. Yes. But that's different than practicing by myself. So I think finding that balance is something I'm still sort of trying to focus on. Wow. Listen, I've got to get your autograph now while it's free. Because, but man. <laughs> Woo, this is this is wonderful. So so what do your peers think about you? I'm not really sure if it's anything negative, then I'm not sure about it because they must have not told me, but from what I have gotten, I yes. think they're happy and happy for me. And listen, the negativity, we're not even we're, we're not gonna talk about that. We leave those others <laughs> to the side, right? All about positivity. And all about you going forward and uplifting as many people as possible. This is fantastic. This is fantastic. So, Laura, I just want you to hang off to the side, and uh, we want to bring okay. in your mother real quick. And then this is going to be this is going to be a chance for all of us just to uh, go back and forth with conversation. So, mom, I mean, we, yes. we, you you you, you got to bring it now, mom. Your your daughter is fantastic. <laughs> you know, it, wow. it's so lovely to just hear her speak, yes. and you know. You can't hear me smiling, but I'm like, okay, look at her. Look at her cannon <laughs> on this conversation. Yes. And happy, well thought, if, you know, responses. I'm just very proud of her and where she is and where she's going and yes. how she's growing. It's just, Absolutely. I'm blessed. Absolutely. So, so Doc, let's, let's do this. How did you become this international jazz how do I say educator, it? educator, yeah. scholar? Yeah. How did, how did you become such? How did you become all of that? You know, um, by the grace of God. Yes. Amen. He blessed me with a, with a, a wonderful supportive family that I grew up with. And then yes. of course a, a very supportive and loving husband that continued to, to allow me to create the platform to be able to help so many other people. Yes. So, you know, starting with school, I have four degrees and it seemed like with each degree <laughs> I was trying to get more answers, yes. you know, as to what it was that I really, not so much really wanted to do, but, but what, what, what it was exposing to me is my purpose. Yes. So, you know, I started off in California. I'm born and raised in Cali. I'm Oakland, California. And when I did my undergrad in jazz and even though I started off as an engineering major, which is actually how I met my husband. Yes. There was a, a organization called NSBE, National Black, um, National Society of Black Engineers. Um, and I met him there and when, during a internship. And after I had that internship and was with so many people and they were saying, and they heard me sing because yes. I was still singing, uh, but just kind of on the side. And they were like, why are you majoring in engineering? Why are you not majoring in music? Yes. And that sparked my change into music. And then once I started going into music and, and realizing I wanted to learn more yes. and wanted to learn more and more, of particularly about black music, yes. particularly about jazz and gospel, and recognizing that there were not many people at the academic, at the high education level in, in music education that was really talking about these styles, particularly from a vocal standpoint. Yes. And as a result, I started researching and researching, and then it made me become a pioneer in this field. Wow. Um, just being able to be the first to, to codify um, old teaching strategies for, for teaching black music. Wow. That brought me here, yeah. Wait, 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 wait. wait. So you are, you were the first person or the first African-American woman to codify the teaching of black music? So what it is, is that um, most of the time yes. in voice training, yes. voice training as it exists in academia is largely based on classical music. Okay. Right. Yes. So what would happen is people that would say, okay, I'm going to teach spirituals from an academic standpoint. You know, yes. in, within academ academia, they would teach it from the standpoint of classical music. Okay. And you. they have this false sense of if I learn classical music, then I can sing anything. 
right? And that was the narrative. That was the academic narrative that was going around. And so with my research what that I did in graduate school, it was like, no, how about we create and codify a system for teaching black music, particularly gospel music, is where I focus on by voice science and cultural expectations and, and cultural research on, on gospel music. Um, and then what we know about what, it, what you need to teach to create our own pedagogic system yes. instead of trying to define us through another narrative. You know, so that was that was my contribution to the field of, of vocal pedagogy. And that's what I'm known for is it. bringing this new outlook um, that says, hey, um, bring this diverse outlook to say this is let's let's look at teaching this music for what it what, for what it is, not through what it's not yes, yes. or what you think it should be. You know, so now my, my next question is uh, based on what you were known for. How did you land in Princeton University? So my um, my last two degrees were at Teachers College, Columbia. Yes. yes. And one of my colleagues was the head and founder of the jazz department at Princeton. Okay. And his name was Dr. Is, Dr. Anthony Branker, Tony Branker. He's now at Rutgers. But when he was here at Princeton, he started a new program with vocal called the Jazz Vocal Collective, which is an ensemble that I teach now at Princeton. Yes. And he, you know, he had, of course, taken classes with me and he was like, you know, I really love your approach to students and to, to, to music. And I'd like you to come and be a part of this program. Yes. So I started coming once a semester and then that turned into every semester and it turned into voice teaching <laughs> along with ensemble directing and here I am. It'll be 10 years. Start next, next academic year wow. will be my 10th year at Princeton. So it has um, really, really, really grown into um, a part of me. Now, have, I'm, you, I'm, have you thought mm-hmm. about uh, teaching at, a, at another university? Uh, maybe during Actually, the yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, well, first there's a couple of things that I've been doing that I'm, that I'm doing now. Number one, there's a brand new program that started at Long Island University in Brooklyn. Yes. That is called Rock Nation School of Music, Sports and Entertainment. Rock Nation as in Jay-Z's company. Yeah, yeah. Uh, partnered with Long Island University at Brooklyn to form this new school of music. And that started last fall, the first class. So I'm, I'm teaching there as well. So I'm teaching there in Princeton. And then in the summertime is when I'm usually doing a lot of my teacher training stuff, yeah. my teacher training program. I'm doing a lot of traveling, a lot of clinician work, um, both internationally and domestically this summer. And particularly now that the borders are, everything is back. Yes. <laughs> everything is back in, in, in full swing. So I typically try to say, OK, well, summertime is reserved for all of my travel clinician stuff and I'm also going to be opening um, a, a, the Soul Ingredients. So my brand is called Soul Ingredients. Yes. So I'm opening the Soul Ingredients Voice Teacher Training Academy. And then that will later be the General Music Academy. Um, just to, just to uh, nurture and address the independent music teachers that may not want to go through a, a, a formalized program, but yet want formal education. You know, so those are the things that are in the in the pike, <laughs> if you as you will, of, of, of things that I'm trying to work on and, and expand in addition to my performance career. You and, know, I just had that album drop last yeah, year yeah. and, you know, I need to put another album out. So there's a lot of things that are always that are that are going on. And, you know, it, it, it's been a blessing, again, to be supported by family to be supported again by my kids and my husband and and allowing that platform that we can that i can really stretch and be a blessing to other people it's it's amazing uh, that that you guys even find time to sleep because i'm saying i'm saying to myself kevin (laughs) you're you're not doing enough are you (laughs) i don't Wow, this I, is it, it, fantastic. We, we laugh all the time. We say the Martin House is always going, but yeah. somehow we find ourselves at the dinner table together. Awesome. Somehow, somehow. you know, on purpose. <laughs> now, 
Now, Doc, same, the same question that I, I asked your daughter, but at, at certainly at a much higher level. In terms of Princeton University, uh, do you and have you experienced social injustice and how are you working through it with your music or in the music department? Well, one of the things that has been great um, at Princeton is even through uh, incidences yes. where there's, a, there's some political unrest, through music yes. and through particularly this cultural awakening that has like rocked a lot of academia and, and made um, DEI programs much more at the forefront. Yes. Uh, there's, there's a lot more opportunity. So, for example, I'm teaching a lot more classes that are related to black culture and music. Okay. I'm introducing a lot more, um, introducing a lot more. Uh, classes and programs to not just music students, but to uh, other students on campus through, like, we have winter sessions, or even Teachers of Scholars, which is a program that Princeton gives for area teachers. And so a lot of the classes that I'm teaching has to do with this kind of multidisciplinary uh, content on Black music yes. and protests and all of these different things. So what I appreciate is in all of this, they are really making an effort to make sure that there's information that is accessible to not just the student body, but the community. Fantastic. Fantastic. I think, I think the, the last time that we, we, were, we were talking, I think I was sharing with you, uh, just going back to your gospel roots, right? And I was saying to you mm -hmm. I, that, I, that I, I saw somewhere on Facebook, uh, maybe a YouTube channel, where there was this uh, Asian group and they were saying gospel music. And I was saying to you that, uh, how could that be? Because as far as I was concerned, gospel music was similar to Negro spiritual. You had to feel this. You had to feel that experience. And if you were Asian, not knowing what we went through, how could you feel this thing? Can you talk to that for a minute? Do, are you able to teach that feeling or that has to be well, you know, I think that's a that's a great question, and it's the one that's happening continuously. Like I just gave a Nat chat, a Nats, which is National Association of Teachers of Singing, yes, chat on Black Boys Pedagogy, along with um, Allison Crockett, and that was one of the questions that came up. Yes, you know, was basically, can you sing Black music if you're not Black? Yes, um, and the the answer to that is, I think it's to say that you can't sing and can't learn to adapt to the cultural experience through immersion okay. would mean that a black person couldn't sing classical music or a black person couldn't sing another style of music that might be outside of their cultural experience. Gotcha. You know, which is what they believed in the beginning, you yeah, know, yeah. which is why our, 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 Forefronter, or forerunners of, of classical music had such a hard time because, you know, it was, we were kept out yes. of that experience because they were believed that we didn't have the capacity to do so, right? Um, so I say that to say that that that, that question is, is, is much more involved than yes or no. It's, well, it depends. And it depends on why. It depends on what. It depends on the context. Okay. A lot of the things that I teach now have to do with the difference or the continuum that exists between cultural appropriation, cultural appreciation, and cultural adaptation. Mm -hmm. And understanding that we are in these different continuums all the time when we're looking at culture, when we're looking at music. Yes. The issue becomes when it's, when it's monetized, yes. right? If yes. I'm monetizing at, when, when this, a non-Black person is, is being monetized and celebrating our culture when the people that within the culture are not getting those same monetizations or yes. platforms. Yes. That's where it becomes like, oh, you know, but not so much, but I, I, for me personally, where I am in my life right now at this moment, um, it, it would be hard for me to say, no, you can't sing just because you're not black or just because you don't have the collective memory. Yes. Now, it, sound, it may sound different, um, you know, but I, my goal or my hope is that you will learn my culture yes. and you will learn to appreciate it yes. and learn to celebrate it. 
yes. and by and by singing this music versus just taking the surface level and kind of running with it. So yes, that's where I'm sitting on it right now. Again, this could be, this could evolve, but this is where I am now, and in, in, in particularly because I'm as a cultural activist. Yes, you know, I'm, I'm like, no, we are we are all beautiful, and I think we need to experience each other's culture so that we can appreciate it. Absolutely, I, I certainly do agree with that. So now, where do you where do you see yourself in in three years from now? Uh, how many albums have you have you put out, and and who would be one of the greatest uh, living jazz musicians that you would love to perform with? That's a great question. I think in three years from now, I would I should be working on my third album. Okay, um, because I'd like to get the next one out within the next year. Yes, um, but. Believe it or not, I am looking to shift, not just from from jazz, but shift into celebrating Black music in general. Okay. And shift more into being a recitalist. I have a dream project that I'm putting out into the atmosphere, okay. which is a concert called If They Were One, Mahalia Jackson, Sarah Vaughn, and Jesse Norman. Ooh. So, you know, if... That that would be my dream project. Yes, you know, three years from now, that could be something that I would tour with, that I could do with an orchestra, yes. as well as with a small group, and just going to art cultural centers or or large venues. So I'm I'm really interested in doing those kinds of things more so than yeah, I'm just trying to you know get a Grammy or I'm just trying to get it. I'm more trying to bring all of the academic learning and the cultural learning that I'm doing and been trying to share within academia, yes. but to bring that to the, to the public stage and to put things in context and give and feed the people as we would say in church, right? Yeah, yeah. Give the people something other than just um, ear candy or just to say, hmm, let, let, let me minister, minister to your soul and, and show you yes. um, illustrations of black excellence. But you, but you know, the Grammy's coming though, right? Well, you know, if God, if, if that is in the past, you know, <laughs> I will open the door for that, you know, but uh, we're definitely, yeah. definitely trying to hold, hold steady to, to my purpose or what I believe my purpose no, is. No, I understand. I'm just, I'm just thinking about all the yeah. wonderful connections that you're making. <laughs> you will certainly have the platform for an audience to really hear you to say, you know what, this sister is on to something of greatness. So I, 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 I love it. So for, for both of you guys, uh, Mom and uh, Laura, mm -hmm. what has been some of the biggest challenges that you have faced in your musical, well, for you, Laura, in your musical career? What, has some, what have been some of the biggest challenges that you had to face or overcome? Go ahead, Laura. I'll let you go first. Yeah. Um, uh, well, actually, you can start it off, Mom. <laughs> okay. No, that's totally fine. That's totally fine. I think that ironically, the biggest challenge I found I have found has been um has been organization. Okay. And belief in trying, like in other in other words, trying to decide which what to go first. Yes. I don't feel like I've been inhibited by any person or any situation okay. other than my own self, <laughs> gotcha. you know, being spread to spread too thin, or should I say not even spread too thin, but, but being busy without enough focus to bring things together. Got you. And that has been the challenge of overcoming. And I think Laura falls into that. And, and, you know, as you talk to her and hear how busy she is and trying to organize these different passions and interests, I, you know, the, the challenge is always how do we put them in a line? How do we make them align with each other so they're really supporting each other? Yes, yes. You know, because I, 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 I'm blessed to, to not feel like something or someone is not holding me back. Understood, understood. Laura, you know? Laura same, same question. What has been some of your biggest challenges that you had to overcome as far as music? Yeah. Um, so basically, my mom sort of said what my main struggle is, which is being in. Okay, so I'm like, as I said before, I'm in a lot of clubs. I run a lot of different clubs. Yes. And luckily, now I'm out of uh, AP season, uh, which is, I mean, advanced placement uh, classes. Yes. So the test for that is done. So now 
I'm hoping that that will give me more time rather than studying to then now focus on fully crafting and develop further developing everything that I've been working towards this past year, whether it be being more um, organized for my events for the Black Student Union, yes. um, be like writing out a full calendar of all of the events, potential events that I want to happen for next year, or just being able, to, as I said before, um, getting a practice schedule together. I'm really trying to get that together and be more consistent with my practicing and developing my craft. Understood. And well, well spoken. So now personal question, when you guys are not working or, 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 or working on your craft, what music do you listen to? And do you listen to music like of today's people? Uh, Doc, you want to go first with that one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, ironically, the music that I listen to the most, actually it's not ironic to you, but it would be ironic to people that don't know me, um, would be gospel. Yes. I think gospel music is the only music that I don't feel like I'm analyzing <laughs> while I'm listening to it. Understood. It's like you know? you're, you're more like relaxed. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. It's much more relaxed and it's much more, you know, depending on the playlist, the gospel playlist that I'm listening to. Yes. So I tend to listen to a lot of gospel music, although I still like some of the new like jazz singers. Like I'm a big fan of Gregory Porter. Okay. Um, and Jasmine Horn, I, I really like a lot and, and appreciate. And, and in terms of, of my R and B stuff, I, I, I still like the Neil soul quite a okay. bit. I'm still a Jill Scott fan, you know, but I find that because I'm always in research mode yes. when I'm listening to a lot of the songs, a lot of the music and styles that I teach, I'm always like trying to dissect it and understand what people are doing so that I can add it to descriptions and all that kind of stuff. So gospel music right now is my, is my for fun playlist. Okay. Laura, same question. When you're, when you're relaxing, what music are you listening to? Yeah. If, if, if I'm not listening to whatever my mom's listening to, usually <laughs> I'm, <laughs> usually I'm more into um, the neo soul black indie or um, black indie match with rap or okay. the jazz rap gotcha. um, category with like, People like Jill Scott, Erica Badu, D'Angelo, How the Creator, yes. The Root, um, Tribe Called Quest. People like that as the, the main ones I've been checking out. Okay. Um, but for jazz, I've been listening to a lot of Ambrose, uh, amazing trumpet player. Uh, I've been checking out India Owens, who is an incredible bass player. Yes. Also, um, black, black female. female. Mm -hmm. there. Yes. Incredible, um, yeah. And un and unfortunately for me, I've got to um, broaden my musical ears. All I listen <laughs> to is house music. <laughs> <laughs> but house music, as I'm learning, especially from being around you, is it, it's so diverse. Like there's so many different aspects yeah, yeah. Of, well, well, of of house that you could be diverse with. House yeah, well, by itself, so well, you know. Well, you know, Doc, I had turned you onto Gospel House. I, I sent you that link for Gospel House, and I know one day while we were working on the sound system in the church, you were playing Gospel House music. I was like, "Hey, yeah. I say so." So I got to get better with that. But let me let me <laughs> let me ask this question though: as a as a people, right? Do you think people beyond us really celebrate our music, or do you think it's like forced upon them? if that makes sense with that question. Yeah. I, you know what? I think, I, you know, I, I think it's apparent that internationally black American music is the most dominant sound okay. and culture. Gotcha. Um, but what sometimes I think happens is that we're not recognized for the influence and the foundation behind a lot of the music that people are listening to. Yes. So they're celebrating things, not realizing that, oh, you like that, but it, you know that sounds from us, you know, or or not recognizing, particularly with American music, how much roots yes. of Black and African American or African roots are within the music. Yes. Um, like country music, it's always associated with um, white culture, right? Yes. But 
the banjo is African instrument. It's derived from African instrument. That yeah, you yeah. know, that whole all of these things. I think that is is mis. Not, I don't want to say misunderstood. Well, sometimes misunderstood, but it's just not valued in the same way that it that it that it should be. And I think people don't know it all the time. And or they're fascinated by it. They're like, oh, my gosh, yes. I'm fascinated by this culture. And then they tend to appropriate it because they're like, oh, I can be cool like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that's what I think happens the most. Yes. Now, you know, the, 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 the interesting thing that I find about music is while we are not getting the exposure, right, I think that mm-hmm. a lot of times on the back end, they are finding ways, like as you said earlier, to monetize and to distribute what we do unknowingly, and we don't get right. the credit for that. So how do we? How we do don't we, get the credit. How do we? How do we change that? And how do we get more people to get into that part of the business of distributing your own work and your own music too? How do we do that? That's so complicated. That's a complicated um, answer, and I and and I don't know the answer. Too. I think we've been trying to figure that out for all these years. I, yeah. You know, I, I feel like Barry Gordy with Motown was the first to bring black culture to pop mainstream. Yes. Right. Because all of our stuff was getting stolen. Yes. So they're like, oh, OK. So if white radio wants to hear this pop version of of this of these race records, let me just make black music for white audiences. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. He had that kind of mindset to to do those things, but it and it helps. I mean, you know why we have so many black artists that are pop crossover artists. Yes, the difference, but it's but to really be able to celebrate our artists at the level that these other that these multi million dollar corporations are able to push narratives. It, you know, it's going to it's going to go all the way down to how do we get our black businesses to be yes. in the forefront, right? Yes. Like it's a it's, it's a part of a larger systemic shift yes. that needs to occur. So you know, it's more than just oh, let's just buy, let's start supporting our own music. No, it, it's bigger than that. You know, it's it's bigger than that. But for each pe- person that has a platform, see if you can use that platform to share the wonderful the black excellence, the things that are going on. That that would be the, the the process that I know of at this moment. Now when now when people uh first meet you, Doc, what what are they what's the first impression that most people walk away or what's the first impression people get from you? Do they I mean, I mean how do how do they take you? How do they receive you? Well most of the time I think because I'm so casual. Yes. And intentionally. Okay. You know that I I find people to 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 um, let their guards down around yes. me. Yes. Regardless as to their social, economic, or education status. Yes. You know I I because I am unapologetically myself. Yes. I have noticed that even the most dignified quote unquote will seem to be more relaxed, okay. and even our community folks that may not have the same uh, privileges yes. as we do, you know, around the church also will seem comfortable, <laughs> okay. you know, and I think that that's, that's a strength. I a strength that, that that's one of my, my blessings and my gifting to, to make people feel comfortable. Now, um, now let, so, me, let me, let me, let yeah, me for ahead. a second. I apologize. Cause as you were talking, I was, I was thinking about this. If people were to meet you and you were to introduce yourself as Trinice versus Dr. Trinice, do you think you would get a different response? Um, no. No? Okay. N- no. I what what I I have found because as someone that you know, I do introduce myself as Dr. Trinice in certain circles. Yes. What I I what I've found that People will be more curious. Okay. Uh, when I say Doctor Trini, got you. You know, got you. And particularly depending on their their demographic. Understood. You know that that always that always makes a makes a, a difference in a shift. Understood. Um, because in different in different avenues. I might be around a bunch of people where everybody has their doctorate. Yes. Right. 
so it, it 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 depends and i feel like at the end of the day what the difference is i think is that black people particularly yes are more prideful yeah 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 you know what i mean are yeah. more prideful they're like that is that's my sister right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the difference. <laughs> and, and and again, when you're around black folks, you got to throw in the doctor. You know, <laughs> you got. Yeah, that's yeah. The, <laughs> that's the difference. That's yeah. the difference that I that I that I found. Now you know what's so funny. It, my my brain just went to another when I when I did a summer program at uh, Babson, right? Uh, probably world renowned for uh, teaching entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. And I met this guy, forgot his name, but uh, the, his kids called him uh, R2D2 because he had uh, two masters and two doctorates in uh, like entrepreneurship and some other in economics or something like that. But he, this guy was like, he was like, he was just brilliant. But because he was around his colleagues, mostly white folks, he was just low key, right? And I, right. And I right. said to another buddy of mine, I said, if he came around, the black folks would call himself R two D two. They would smack him upside his head because you know they <laughs> they would not respect him or appreciate him. So you got to you know you got to come with the pedig you know with us you got to come with the pedigree first <laughs> you know often times. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I mean, well, you know, it's funny. I for for me, I haven't really had that. Um, I haven't had that experience in terms of feeling like I needed to. Understood. Ironically, what I needed to prove yes. for certain demographics is I needed to prove that I can do. Gotcha. So, like going around kids, the so order to get their attention, I have to sing. Got you. And Got then you. I'm like, oh, you can talk to me now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, oh, she <laughs> you know can sing. I, she can sing. Right, <laughs> right. You know. Then they're like, oh, okay. I, I, you know, college students, college to high school. Yeah. You know, that's where that's that's what that's the kind of things that you need even more than the. Than, than the letters gotcha. behind your name. Gotcha. <laughs> now, so that, that's another question. So in your, in your, in your, um, I guess uh, at Princeton, when you do a class, is that the first thing you have to do with your students? Do you have to sing a song for them or, or let them know that you, you, you can sing? I mean, is that like unwritten well, for you or? Well, the interesting thing is because I've been there so long yes. and a lot of the, they, they know what I do. Yes. So I don't necessarily have to do that as much at Princeton. Okay. Um, coming into like Brooklyn, for example, and then the Rock Nation School. Yes. You know, I this was a different demographic, yes. and you know, I'll tease them, and I was like, I'll say, Google me. Yes. You know, <laughs> so you need to know who I am. Google me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go Google, me, and yeah, then yeah. you'll learn, right? Yeah, yeah. And so you do that, and then they go, Oh, oh, I was checking you out. Oh, I was checking out your album. You know what I mean? And then. Yeah. They have a different demeanor, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but yeah, that yeah. that's more so than than anything for me in my experience. No, because I, I, I think I asked this question of both of you before. I don't know if I I, I, I did. Five years from now, right? Where is the mm-hmm. best place you would want to do your best concert? Five years from now, if you had to Ooh, do a five concert, years, yes. Wow, that's a good question. I would like in five years, if prayerfully I do things right, yes. I would want to be at like a, a, a Kennedy Center, a Kimmel Center, okay, a larger, a larger venue. Okay, okay, Laura. Same, that that same. would that would be my like. Come on, <laughs> okay. Laura. Same question. I, I thought you would say something overseas, uh, Doc. No, I'm already singing overseas, and I don't know the venues like that. But I'm okay. I'm more. T- I'm looking at more, um, you know, what what that means. Gotcha. You know, the American status. Okay, so yeah. Lincoln Center or Kimmel Center? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So something, something, some a larger venue. Okay. okay. Like that. Laura, same question. Five years from now. Um, well, I think the main thing would be just being able to headline because. Fortunately, I've been getting these opportunities to perform at all of these places. But, um, like, I performed at Birdland with um, the Grace Fox Big Band, which is an all-female band. Yes. I performed at these multiple times uh, with the Jazz at Lincoln Youth uh, Orchestra. Yes. I performed at South Jazz Kitchen. There's been a lot of places that I've had the opportunity to perform at. Yes. But 
my goal is to headline at these places rather than be a part of a group, which is cool too, but wow. that's one of my main. Now, do, 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 does any one of you guys have an, uh, an agent currently? No, we don't. <laughs> my mom is Got, my agent. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> doc, I mean, do, right. doc, do you think you need an agent though? I do. Okay. I do. Yeah, no, I, I definitely do. Um, in terms particularly, but I've always pulled back because again, just wanting to be really clear about where, where am I going with my entity, with my entrepreneurship? Yes. You know, what is, how do they all fit together and okay. understanding what I want to do? I think I needed to do that first. Okay. So have you I'm ever, a bit of manager. Have you, you ever know? thought about doing anything on the new Orleans, uh, jazz scene? Yeah, I mean, um, because I'm also the executive director of the African American Jazz Caucus and also a board member with Jazz Education Network, we're in New Orleans quite a bit. Okay. Um, you know, and but again, I think I I have put a lot more emphasis and focus on the academic side of what I do. Gotcha. That that's where I'm saying that I think this this five year three to five year shift. Yes. It's going to create a lot more balance. Yes. Um. In, in this decade of my life, this next decade of my life. <laughs> and then we can make that cheddar. Woo. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying, boy. <laughs> you make, make me come out and, and do a duet with you. <laughs> I know. Right? <laughs> that's all yes. right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So now, I, one of the things that I, I find so interesting about music, right, is that uh, oftentimes uh, music is not, uh, well, I mean, well, music is often misunderstood, right? So now when you're mm -hmm. teaching a class, do you go back to the historical beginnings of, of music, like coming from Africa? Do they do like this comparison? Do you do that? Or is that? Well, music? yes, but I, but I usually start at the beginning of American music. Okay. So, I'm I'm usually talking about um, spirituals and sorrow songs and work songs and ring shouts. Got you. Um, and and when I'm talking about African music or music from the continent of Africa, I'm usually talking about it from the context of what philosophies carry. Yes. Right. The why behind some of the things that we do, some of that lineage. Okay. Um, per se versus teaching actual um, songs or rhythm, okay. you know, so I don't go back that far where I know some colleagues do Yes, um, that teach black music. So uh, yeah, I take, I'm typically focused on the narrative from the 1600s to 1900s as our first. Okay. Okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, now the next question is uh, the, the faithfulness Faith. How how does faith play into your your musical career, particularly on the jazz side? How does faith in terms of spirituality? Yes, play into the jazz well, side of you. Well, I feel like the everything that I do I feel like everything that I do yes. is spiritual and a part of my ministry. Okay. Regardless as to whether or not it's whether or not it's singing R and B or whether or not it's singing jazz. Yes. I'm always very cautious about what am I singing? Yes. And what am I hoping to feed the people? Got you. Okay. Right? Because I'm always in a uh, context where I can't be overtly religious, right? Yes. In academia, you, you you can't be overtly like, oh, everybody should follow Christ and all this kind of different things. Yes. So as a result, I have focused a lot more on being a represent a representative, if you will. Understood. Letting people see me and hope that and praying that they see God through me. Understood. And, and want to be curious, want to realize that I'm thinking that oh, she's different. There's something different. What is it different? Yes, and, yes. I, and I hear that being successful when I'm like again overseas, or you know even in academia. Yes. Where 
I get people that are much more inquisitive. They say, they say there's something about you. It's like you shine different. <laughs> <laughs> the glow, the glow <laughs> and is like, different. Yes, yes. The glow is different. Yes. And, and that's the, that's what I want to do and make sure that I'm persisting with even in my jazz. Like my jazz album, it's very spiritual. Yes. Um, you know, in terms of not just the content, but what it is that I'm hoping to bring the the audience to this collective sense of joy and understanding. Now, 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 you you mentioned overseas. Now, when you're overseas, how do they perceive you uh, when you're overseas? Well, there's, you know, ironically, they typically perceive me as exotic, as they do most African Americans. Got you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's actually quite interesting. It's funny and interesting at the same time, you know, um, in the, in the sense of, but at the same time, they, they give me so much more credibility, Got you. Yes. um, you know, as a, a cultural representative. Okay. Um, and, and you can also make the argument that my degrees and stuff make a difference. There, you yeah. know, me traveling as, Dr. Trinise Robinson Martin from Princeton University yes. has a very different um, connotation. Yes, then Trinise much then, more. Yeah, then, yeah. Then Trinise absolutely. traveling. Yeah, got you. Now, absolutely. Now, I, I when when I when I asked about the five year thing, I was I was hoping that I was going to hear a, a mother daughter um, album that was going to drop in five years, if not earlier. Is that, is that well? I'm works? I'm hoping that um, you know in three in the next album. Not hoping. I know that okay. you know Laura will be on some tracks on that album. Wow. You know, and then depending upon where she goes, I mean, five years. I'm think I, I was like, wow, five years. Laura will be getting her bachelor's degree. Yes. You know, and depending on where she is, it's going to really determine, you know, what's what's next. And yes. so, I'm I'm excited and really trusting God on whatever, you know, it, He has planned for us. Yes. You know, and and but at the same time being prepared. <laughs> Und understood, understood, understood. I, I'm t listen with the with the time that we have left. I I just want to thank you guys so much. This was this was fun. And uh, Laura, you still there? Yeah, okay. I'm here. Thank yeah. you so much for having me. Yeah. Oh my, it's you guys are fantastic. I am. I am. Uh, I'm I'm praying nothing but success for everything that you do and your heart's desires. But before we go, I want to give you this platform. Anything else that I might have missed that you would want us to know that you would want to share about your academic career, your music career, and your jazz career, not to separate those two. <laughs> I know. But yeah. Go ahead, Laura. I just wanted to uh, quit because my mom forgot to. Uh, she kept mentioning her album, but she hasn't said what the album is called. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you can find that on Spotify or Apple Music, and yes. it's called All or Nothing. Yes. Uh, just search up Shanice Robinson, and you should find it right away and give it a listen. Okay. Yep, and I, I would definitely say to just look out for Soul Ingredients Music Academy online Yes. as, as something that is progressing and definitely keep a look out for, for Laura and her all of her accomplishments and the ways that she's going to manifest her spirituality and manifest who she is as a wonderful leader um, young leader so let's yes. keep an eye out follow us on Instagram Laura Laura what is your Instagram Laura Martin <laughs> you have to spell it <laughs> it's Laura <laughs> it's Laura yes um, L A U R A dot Martin, but it's spelled weird because the username was taken. So it's M A R P I I N N N. Wow. <laughs> and you can follow me at Dr. Shrinese. Okay. You but, know, at, on all social media platforms. But but listen, before 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 we drop the episode though, when you guys go to give me your bio, all those links. Uh, as to how we can stay connected, please, please do so. Right. And then, Absolutely. and then doc, when we finish this uh, interview, just text me the link of one of your favorite songs and I'll post that on my, on my site. Right. Okay. That sounds okay. great. Now, I, I, know, I appreciate you so much no, for no, no. having us and inviting us to this space. Now you, you may not appreciate me after I ask this request. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, 
Yeah, let's can can you guys end with like a 30 second gospel song that you guys can sing together? Um yeah, Laura, if why don't you come downstairs um so that we can get on the same Yeah, yeah, yeah. What what, what are we going to sing? That's a good question. You know, I, what are I, we going to sing? I like Amazing Grace. Oh. She said he likes Amazing Grace and she said she likes her side of the sparrow. Who? His eye is on the sparrow. Okay, okay. It's it's your show. Take it away then. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Yeah, go yeah. ahead, Laura. Why should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadow come? And why should my heart been long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion of constant is I is I And I know he watches me. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Ladies, fantastic. I thank you both. This, listen, this was this this interview far exceeded my expectations. And Doc, I'm so glad that you said let's hold up. Let's get Laura on the phone as well. This was fantastic. And uh, nothing but continued blessings and continued success with uh, both academically and where you going entrepreneurially. Listen, keep me posted, all right? Sure will. And thank you again so yeah. much, Kevin, for everything that you do for the community, for the church, and just the, 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 the effort that you do to promote other entrepreneurs. Absolutely. I, we just appreciate you. Yeah, on no. behalf of everybody, I'm going to say I appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, you guys have a great day and we'll talk in text later on. Sounds good. Okay. Thank now. you so much. All right. Okay, bye. bye bye. That concludes another episode of the entrepreneurial enclave with Kevin Wortham, the podcast that focuses on building, maintaining, pivoting, planning, and investing in you, the entrepreneur. We hope you found this episode informative and enlightening. If you have any questions or comments about any of our episodes, please call 609-731-9311 or email kevin at minding-our-business.com. We look forward to joining us for our next one. Until next time.